The warehouse was the venue in New Orleans. A concert there was a totally different feel than a, a concert at Municipal Auditorium or anywhere else in the world. The warehouse just came along at a time where, you know, coming out of the coming out of the '60s, coming into the '70s, just that energy was there, you know. And and while that kind of scene had already happened in San Francisco and other places. You know, that was completely new to New Orleans. I was there just about every time I didn't have a gig or something, I'd just hang out at the warehouse because that was the place to be. Didn't have a lot of blacks, but when you came, you were welcome. It was a, kind of a local lightning rod for the same stuff that was kind of going on in a lot of places. And, and when you get lost in a sea of kids and they're all smoking pot and, and carrying on, and, sneaking booze in there before we sold booze to them. It was about letting go and opening up and relaxing and letting your mind free, you know? There were things that went on in that joint that, uh, that you know, our parents would not have approved of. There was definitely a lot of pot smoking going on there, <laughs> for sure. If you're gonna be a bad boy or a bad girl, it probably happened down at the warehouse. Going to the warehouse was like going to church. You'd walk up to the place and it was, I mean, it was, it was just kind of unassuming. It's this big brick structure. It looked like a, any number of warehouses are in that part of town. Some people would say, what a seedy place, but that just added to it, you know? <laughs> it added to the character and all. You'd kind of smell it before you'd see it. The smell of sweat and the smell of marijuana and the smell of, of you know, stale beer. Uh, you know, all the good things in life. It was the venue. You could have had a venue like this in another place, but it wasn't New Orleans. It was all about the music. The music was the thing. I think we were so provincial before that. We had our local music, and I do mean local. People in New Orleans had heard and grew up on blues and rock and roll and jazz. Arma Thomas played at my junior prom. Mac Rabinac played at my senior prom as Mac Rabinac. I think people here were more open to whatever kind of music would flow in, in and out of the warehouse. We would hear all kind of stuff in there. As far as having a place or a club that size, that was just a first. And to have bands like Allman Brothers and King Crimson, all these type of acts, coming through there on a weekly basis, it, it was just phenomenal. That was that place where we felt connected to something much bigger than just a New Orleans venue. It's our music of our time, and all those combined to make it something very, 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 very special. I was born and raised in New Orleans, and I went to Holy Cross High School, and I moved to Chicago in 1966. And lived there through 69. During that era, um, I was uh, working in the bars in Chicago as a bartender, bouncer, uh, collecting IDs, checking IDs, and uh, the last place I worked was a place called Barnaby's. And uh, on, on a Sunday night, they had alternating groups that would play, and one was called The Big Thing at that time. And 40 years later, they still call it Chicago today. And they were recording the Chicago Transit Authority album in New York. They invited me to come. I, I went there for a weekend, and I went with them to uh, a live gig that they had at, at Bill Graham's Fillmore East. They opened up for Buddy Miles. And it was unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. And I said, God. Man, we didn't have anything like this in New Orleans. So I went back to Chicago, told my two roommates what we had. They decided they were going to come down. They wanted to be involved, and the three of us were going to start it. And also, um, some other friends of ours were going to come as well to help us with it and work with it, uh, Don Fox and Brian Glenn and a couple other folks. They told me about this new place in New Orleans, and they offered me like $20,000 plus all my expenses for a year if I came down there and helped them get up and running and assuming it was going to be successful. An attorney friend of mine said, look up this attorney by the name of John Simmons, and he'll help you out. So I came to New Orleans. I contacted John Simmons, and we started trying to find a place. And uh, we did. 1820 Chopitula Street. T-C-H-O-U-P-I-T-O-U-L-A-S. Because everybody you talk to 
want to know what is that and how do you spell it? When I got here in 1969, um, it was when I saw it, it was a cotton and coffee warehouse. It was about 105 or 106 years old. It was uh, 27,369 square feet divided in by five rooms, five, four walls. And uh, when we got here, I looked at it, I started saying, what am I doing here? It wasn't quite the bar right off of Bourbon Street that I originally envisioned um, that I was coming to New Orleans for. It was a big warehouse right off the ghetto. The location of the warehouse was kind of like a place where nobody used to go. I mean, that was not a very well-developed area of town back then. And it was still pretty much an industrial slash slum area, and nobody ventured back there. But we like that. I remember once walking, because there was a housing project uh, very close to there, and I remember walking from the streetcar, and I was by myself, and uh, I'm walking by the project, and his brick came sailing over my head and hit the street on the other side and skidded to a stop. And I looked over and there's two guys and they, they didn't look too friendly. And I, I sort of pointed just to let them know where I was heading, that I wasn't, I wasn't planning to linger. And they kind of did a sweeping gesture with their hand as a move, move along, move along. And I did, I did. When I came down and found, we found the building, uh, John told me we needed, to, we needed to form a corporation. So Beaver Productions was the corporation and uh, the operating business was a warehouse because that's what it was, it was a warehouse. But eventually, all the people that came in, no one called it a warehouse, everybody called it the warehouse. So we changed it. The original guys that Bo was putting the idea together, uh, they basically just tried to raise money. They were trying to put together the package so there would be a building fund and you know an operation fund. I think that, you know, like any new business, you know, you don't really see the true costs. It wasn't like today in corporate America where you do your business plan and you get your money together and you do all these the good things and the right things, which you should do, and perhaps we should have done it because we had a lot of financial issues during those, those if, well, I was with the business for the first five years and we, had, we definitely had a lot of issues. So, uh, but it was like, it was a dream. It was uh, something we really wanted to do that we felt would be successful and uh, we worked hard. And right in the beginning when we were doing the construction, the place wasn't even open yet, my two roommates decided, nah, we don't want to do this. And uh, Don and Brian became partners. And uh, eventually John Simmons became the uh, fourth partner. And that was it, that's how it basically started. You know, Fox really, was the driving force with the construction. He knew what to do, he knew how to do it. He had been doing that his summers for years and years, so he was, he was real good at you know, uh, taking on the tasks and uh, organizing you know, the people that had to be there. When I first flew into town, they had part of the band, uh, the, the, the stage up. They had started on basically the plumbing and the infrastructure, superstructure for the, for the decking. They didn't have I don't even know if they had doors. <laughs> yeah, I think there was plywood <laughs> back in the door, you know? I think we were all shocked when we were, because we had to put the bathrooms in, we had to do all the plumbing, we had to do all the electrical. I mean, it was, it was quite an undertaking. It was um, basically five bays of warehouses that was all enclosed and after we actually got it, we had to literally open it up. At that time, I wasn't, I was more of a laborer. We were trying, everyone was like out there just trying to get the place ready. And I painted and I hammered, you know, I did everything <laughs> like everybody did. It was, it was really a blast, man, to work with these people with a dream, you know. Black topped the floor, sandblasted it, had a sprinkling system in it. We wanted to make sure that we had everything up to code on what we what we did. In fact, we put extra uh, exits in the building. They, they had two, I think we went to four at least. When we built the, uh, the restrooms in the place, they only needed two. We put, I think, 10 into it. Built bleaches around the the outside of it and behind, if the stage was right here, behind the bleaches that were back there, we had a concession area. 
there was a plumber that came up and worked, stayed up for three days straight, plumbing, you know, just to get that uh, service area, especially where they sold the beverages on, you know, the deck, the big deck. And uh, he worked his butt off. There was really no expertise or even thought about keeping the upkeep. I mean, it was really difficult to keep up with because the termites just ate the ceiling to death, the roof, and to go fix this and fix that. You know, when we were working on the place and getting it ready, we had no idea how a band was going to uh, sound in there. And Bill knew these guys from his band, White Clover. They were a local band, and we had seen them play. They are really good. And he got these guys to come over, and before we opened, I think it was a couple of days or a a day or two days before we opened, they came in and played, just so we could see and hear us, you know, how a band would look and how they'd sound in there. They sounded great. Eventually, actually, White Clover, some of the guys uh, became Kansas. They came, became the band Kansas. Then they started advertising that first show, The Grateful Dead, Fleetwood Mac and the Flock, January 30th, 1970. It was uh, very tense. I mean, I think you probably talked to some people that came there. They knew the concert was coming on, and they actually came in and helped hang doors. We were hanging doors be two hours before we were open. There were people gathering outside, and we were hanging doors. Putting up the fire hardware where the crowd was trying to storm the door. And the firemen were right there, the cops were right there, and everything. And they came in through the door. We got the last screw in, and they opened the doors. <laughs> it was fun. It was nail biting, but we got it done and we got open. The first night that I ever heard about the existence of the warehouse, um, my girlfriend Chris Anderson and I were listening to what was then known as underground radio. Um, and we heard somebody talking about, uh, you know, this new club. Uh, concert space, you know, uh, music venue, and this was Fleetwood Mac with Peter Green and Jeremy Spencer. That was pretty amazing. Nobody ever heard of the flock, but then when uh, it was Peter Green and Fleetwood Mac, and that was where everybody, I think, was really peaking, and, you know, dancing and just everything. Peter Green and Fleetwood Mac blew me away. I mean, I had never heard them before, <laughs> and they blew me away. Rattlesnake shake. After Grateful Dead started, after about four or five songs, all of a sudden people just kind of started fading a little bit, some of them, because they were worn out. To hear about it, it sounds like everybody in New Orleans was there, but there were very few people there, I think. 500 people the first night at the Grateful Dead and 700 the second night. Something ridiculous. That first show, man, I was there. I was up there running the lights for the Grateful Dead. And and I didn't and, and I wasn't into music. I didn't know anything. I was a kid, I was fifteen years old. What the hell did I know? I didn't know who these bands were that were coming in, you know. And I but I learned quick. It definitely sent a buzz through the community. And of course that night, you know, they all get busted in the French Quarter, they were set up. And that's what the song Truckin's all about, you know, talking about that fateful night, the first night of the warehouse in New Orleans when they finally come down here and the sort of reception that was laid out for them, you know. Stanley Osley was a sound guy for the dead. Um, I think he had some people that were looking at him very seriously. Owsley, uh, who, is, who they were looking for was the Acid King, uh, was also an engineer and, you know, just a brainiac, and he made all the acid. and. He was dousing everybody out of a wineskin. And uh, our attorney told us that it would probably be a good idea to make sure they didn't have any drugs while they were here. And I, when the band, when the guys that were riding with me got in the car, I told them, you know, that it would be a bad idea to have drugs because we heard the police were looking at them. And uh, Osley handed me a joint and he said, shut up and put this in your mouth. It was about that long, about that thick, with purple pot. I got so totally wasted, I got lost leaving the airport. Fox and I were living together. I'm sound asleep in my room, and he's all of a sudden, he got, must have got the phone call, because he comes in, he wakes me up, and says the Grateful Dead got busted. They came up to the hotel. They actually, I believe, went to the warehouse first, and the concert was over. They thought it was like a New Orleans bar, so they went there at 12 o'clock, figuring, OK, this is going to be the time to hit it. But the concert had been over for an hour and they got, I think, Jay in his underwear as the night watchman <laughs> saying, oh, you know, they're not here. Then they went down to the uh, hotel and they were all on basically one floor and 
They started at one end. They kicked in the door that Jerry Garcia leaned into, so it kind of hit him in the face, and they, they all got busted because they were smoking a joint or something. But they really got nothing. You know, they got little bits of marijuana, but that was it. You know, and they never got the person they were really after at that point, Owsley. So we had to get John, and John Simmons got him out. Because uh, getting all the dead uh, out of, out of uh, the incarceration that night took all night to do. So I was probably one of the more infamous uh, things that I had as recall dealing with, uh, with those folks. We had them the next night, and then we, um, then we wound up, we even had a benefit for them on, this, on the uh, Sunday night, just to raise money to give to them. It was before the, uh, the tweeters, the cell phone, and the word got out, and uh, everybody was there. It was really cool. And, you know, everybody came, and I remember it was like a rainy Sunday afternoon, and it was just, you know, it was just really great. The peak of the whole thing to me was Jerry Garcia having a dueling guitar with Peter Green. Each of them would do riffs, and then another riff, then another riff, then another. It was like a heavyweight fight. And then um, all of a sudden, you know, Jerry Garcia just stopped. And, and it, you know... It don't get better than that. They all played and people uh, kicked in money for, for the uh, defense, the Grateful Dead uh, <laughs> defense fund. And uh, there was no convictions or anything that ever came out of it. it. It was a relief in the sense that, God, we finally got this place open. This is great. I mean, we didn't make any money. We lost money that night, the first night, but it was really, uh, it was really a lot of fun. I think when it was all over, said and done, you know, we kind of like, we did it, we pulled it off. We actually did this thing. When they first opened up, you know, the, the board of health and the fire march, everybody wanted to call us down. The place had soul, the place had, had character. It became a badge of honor to turn your back on creature comfort. Because this place did not offer a lot of creature comfort. Looked like maybe $11.58 was spent on furnishings, okay? And the floor was nothing but carpet remnants. Um, that was it. And it was just a big ocean of rugs, basically. It was kind of like walking in the marsh, because you had all these, these you know, old ratty carpets that didn't meet and overlapped each other, and some got rolled up. People tried to make seats out of them. We would just go to stores and just whatever remnants we can get, but large sections of carpet. And eventually, we kept them clean. We kept the place as clean as we possibly could. But when the, when the uh, carpets started getting a little funky, we, uh, we'd go on the radio, WRNO at that time. Bill told me, they said, Cap, you're going to have to tell them if they bring their own carpet, they get in for free for the next concert. Man, everybody and their brother was getting pieces of carpet. And we put all the pieces of carpet all over the floor downstairs before the ball was built and all. But I'm sure a lot of parents would come home and their living room carpet would be gone. Because the kids would take them and get their two free tickets. I always wondered about how many parents came, where's our carpet? It had that, you know, earth mother, natural, you know, uh, <laughs> kind of feeling to it, you know, like which was uh, just the same as, you know, the era that was, was happening in the building and the architecture that all went along with that whole free spirit attitude that was prevalent during the uh, late 60s and early 70s. A gentleman by the name of Hank Newman literally booked the first show, The Grateful Dead, Fleetwood Mac, and The Flock. He was in Chicago and he was a booking agent. And he sort of made the introduction for us with, to, to all these agencies. The year we opened up in 1970, we had a lot of fabulous bands that came in. We had The Birds, Three Dog Night, Can Heat, It's a Beautiful Day, Johnny Winters, Chicago, Proko Harum, The Band, Iron Butterfly, Steppenwolf, Little Richard, uh, Richie Havens, and many others. Um, it's just fabulous. The first time we had Pink Floyd there blew me away because they had first around sound. I think their first American tour, and this was music like we had never heard before, and it was fabulous. Pink Floyd, everyone came high, as high as you could get. I mean, I remember, I remember people, if that was the night to get high, 
they were going to get as high as they could before they walked in the door and stayed that way because it was Pink Floyd and no one had seen Pink Floyd. I mean, this was going to be the concert of, 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 of a lifetime. You know, the certain monikers go with certain bands. Back then, Pink Floyd was like a real headband, you know, it was like it was a lot of sound effects and techno stuff and, you know, it was pretty crazy. It's almost like, you know, if, if, if you're going to go ride the Zephyr roller coaster at Pontchartrain Beach, you got to take mescaline. You know, if you're going to go hear Pink Floyd, you got to take something. <laughs> it's not like you can just go there and just go, yeah, it's cool, man. No, because they do that on purpose. But I seem to remember it was either a really stormy night, but the place was almost empty. If there were 100 people there, I'd be surprised. So when you were in the music, you were so in the music because it was like you were listening to it all by yourself. It was a phenomenal evening. It was the first time in the warehouse that this quadraphonic sound was set up. And at one point, you literally f thought you were hearing people walk on the roof. We're all feeling good. And Godzilla still starts walking on the ceiling because everybody's quiet. All of a sudden, you hear these footsteps coming right over you. And it, yeah, it could have been one of those movies. Uh, Japanese going, ah! Everybody's looking around, and yeah. They were awesome. I mean, it was a great show. The next morning, we got a call that their, their, the entire truck was stolen. You know, not just some of the equipment. Everything was gone, which was so weird. And I mean, the only thing we could really do was we called uh, the radio station to see if they can kind of just tell people about it. And if anybody found out anything, <laughs> call the police, I guess. Yeah, it was one of the roadies with an FBI agent that found the truck out on Sheppentour Highway, I believe, it had just been taken for a joyride, unopened. They did find it and everything came back and nothing was missing. Very odd. We had signed contracts with Jimi Hendrix and, John, and Janis Joplin, and they both died before they came there. But December the 12th, 1970, for $5, you got to see Jim Morrison go crazy. The Doors show, um, actually there, there, there was stress and concern that the police were going to come in and make sure the guy, the singer, didn't drop his pants again. <laughs> he did my Miami <laughs> He was not in, you know, the best of shape all day long. When I came in for the sound check, he just seemed like he was loaded. The band was really trying to straighten up, and they went in one limo, and Jim, who wasn't trying to straighten up, went in the other limo, and he started eating all this opium, and he was eating three times as much as everybody, so he was just getting so stoned. The only band member we've had that loaded on stage. I don't think anyone ever got that loaded on stage. It was Jim Morrison with a Jack Daniels bottle in one hand and a puke bucket next to it. I thought that was pretty bizarre, you know, because this guy was huge. Also at the time, he was also huge. Um, big beard, big belly, you know, big throwing up. That was kind of unattractive. <laughs> it was like forever. Oh, it was terrible. But every once in a while, there's this huge glimmer of, oh my God, it's the doors. He, um started passing out sparklers, lighting them, and just going with that deep voice going, oh, groovy. Just looking at them going out, lighting them, sending out, and I'm just thinking of Billy and Don Fox freaking out. It wasn't one of his better shows, and it seemed like he was really frustrated. He had gotten so loaded that he actually passed out in the middle of a song, and light my fire, as a matter of fact. And he just fell down, just laid on the stage. And he slept most of the set. Um, he was just there and nodded out on the drums. Which to me seemed like for 15, 20 minutes, might have been for, I, I don't know how long. It was long enough for the band to actually leave the stage and go back into the dressing room and leave Jim on the floor. And then he just started singing the song again and the band just walked back out, started playing. It was interesting that at the conclusion of the show, then when Morrison finally woke up again, and he, and he took, and no one ever else had done this, he took the microphone and he hit the stage so hard with it, it broke the floor and went through the floor. I mean, and it was, this, this stage was built sturdy. Um, but he wound up breaking the floor a bit, you know. 
I thought that was like an interesting exclamation point, because that was pretty much it for his career. And who would ever have thunk that that was his last gig, you know? There was a station in Little Rock, Arkansas, called KAAY. And it had a late night show called Beaker Street that was absolutely phenomenal. And it went through the entire South. It was uh, an AM uh, radio show. And people from Texas, uh, Mississippi, Arkansas, Alabama, it was everyone learned about the warehouse. Anybody that was into music was listening to that show. That was like the outlaw station because, oh, there's communication with really cool people you know, going on. So we would occasionally buy uh, time on that, you know, and that really helped us as far as spreading the word. I wouldn't call them underground, but F, uh, uh, FM stations were just coming in then, and they played that type of music. In the days of Beaker Street, you know, I mean, and Mother Radio, when things were so cool, FM only had 3% penetration, and uh, <laughs> that's not very much if you think about it. Eventually, we hooked up with WRNO FM initially, and then WNOE FM. Locally, the only AM station we hooked up with was WTIX because they, would, they were like the number one station in the market, and they were huge. It was a while before we could start actually putting radio ads here in uh, New Orleans. It just was a challenge. I mean, after a while, they kind of accepted that we're going to be here, and they started taking it. So it got to the point where they started learning more and more about selling stuff, and then we started putting up, you know, Sammy Canal, and I would go put up posters in Mobile and posters in Baton Rouge. I had heard that people took them down as fast as they went up. They became objects to art. Sometimes we'd put up posters. Sometimes we'd, we'd go there, put up a couple posters, the cops would stop us uh, from putting them up against the law. So Sammy and I would usually take them, dump in the sewer, and go play pool for the next four or five hours and drink and come back to New Orleans. We'd get the posters from the printer and I'd hand them over to Robin and that was the last I'd see of them. He'd come back three days later and say they were gone. <laughs> and, and then and Bill and Foxy put the posters, yep, all done. Sammy looking at me, we always said, if they ever found out, they would fucking kill us. Bill had started a newspaper called In Your Ear that was basically just a promotional piece that, about bands that we had coming up and, you know, that type of thing. We would always get, whenever we booked an act, we would always get photograph and we'd get a bio. So we took it a, a, a step further. Edwin Krebs was the um, um, first editor that did the paper. And, and what we would do is he would get different people and we would talk to different people and they would write articles or they would do things. Karen, Karen Olivier was a, a big force in this in the very beginning. I was co-editor with Edwin. Edwin was really the big cheese. And I was the helper, more or less. Uh, in Your Ear is, it was a really cool magazine. And it got, everywhere you put it, it got taken up real quick, even at the college, because this Bill had these really intense colors on the cover. It was always these purples that bled into, into blues and stuff. And Bill saw some of my drawings and asked if he could use them on the cover, and then I started doing more things for In Your Ear. But they, you know, talked about the concerts that were upcoming, the concerts that were in the past, uh, ran photos of the concerts, ran reviews, had ads of, of French Quarter, you know, head shops and businesses at the time. There was a place called Far Out, which was on Bourbon Street, which was, um, you know, one of the bigger head shops at the time. Um, it, it was just the warehouse, um, you know, rag sheet. You know, it was it was, it was a little newspaper, and um, and I was their photographer. And then there was the big midnight session of putting the whole thing together. That was also a rush thing with no budget at all, and we sometimes would get ads for it to help offset the expenses, and we'd get those in two days before we had to go to press. Because we were always on the deadline and then getting it out to a printer. And um, it was, you know, seat of your pants at all times. <laughs> and then we eventually were able to build a, mail a mailing list. So we would give this out for free. 
It would be paid for by the advertisers. The, the people who came to the shows could clip out the little coupon, put it in on a mailing list, and eventually we got so many names, we had to start charging a dollar a year to help pay for this thing. And we had, we had names from New Orleans up to Arkansas, from Texas over to Florida. Thousands and thousands and thousands of names. And then there was a little contest we did, like coloring contest for free tickets, or name this part of the warehouse, or do this for free tickets, or um, there were little games to play, book reviews, some really, really wacky recipes that we threw together. This is the first in your ear, okay? And so they had this thing called the Speak Bubble Contest. Okay, win several pounds of albums, including the groups you heard this week and the ones you'll hear next week, eh? Just fill in one or more of all the bubbles with anything that you think might sway us to give you the albums. Send this page or keep it and make a list like Nixon Has Soul and Agnew's Got a Big One Too. Oh, soft mentholated cucumber kazoo. That's where they were in those days. So to show you where I was in those days, I turned each one of these little bubbles into a monster demon that was devouring the people below them. And so uh, turns out that was a slam dunk. And uh, I got all the albums. Yay. For the staff that worked there, and also for the groups, we got these LSU jerseys, and we had a company just sew on the letters that said Warehouse New Orleans to give to the groups so they could take it out, spread the word for us as well. And one of my favorite ones was the old purple and gold, kind of an LSU. Uh, I got one cut off. I, I must have ripped it or something, so I cut it off, but I still have half of it. And the other one, the ZZ Top Live on the back of it's the Warehouse New Orleans, so uh, that's a very special shirt also. And then a, a fog hat shirt back there, that was only, only two of them to my knowledge, were made. One was to give away to a lucky winner, and the other one, Brian Glenn had. And I walked in, I said, I want, I want that T-shirt. You know, you're not getting that T-shirt. He said, I'll tell you what, he liked my blue jean jacket. I had sewn a small American flag patch on the back. He said, I'll arm wrestle you. And Brian was a lot bigger than I was back then. And uh, so I arm wrestled him, and I happened to win. And I got the shirt, and I, I still got it. It's awesome. and. Uh, just in the last year, I can fit back in it again. So I can actually wear it. So that's pretty cool. We got our t-shirts, you know, you get your t-shirts, you're official, you know? And uh, from then on, it was every gig, every show. But we had to do things like that. Now, I don't know why we did it, other than we knew we just couldn't count on the radio stations, or the, you know, the, the whole industry here, because everything was so new. The Ohio players was the, the one that really, really came through with a record called Fire. And it, it, was, it got so big that they wanted to see him. We were in complete control until the very, right, I think right at the beginning, when, right when they started and they, my people outside could hear it. Couldn't get everybody in, so they broke the door down. I mean, physically broke the door down. And they just came on that door, and we tried to hold it, and uh, we could. And so Fox and finally said, "Just let them in." Nobody could do nothing about that, though. Watch the show, fix the door back up, and we're back in business. Only act that, that broke the door. <laughs> that's that's unreal, but that's what happened. Yeah. I do remember when one, I can't remember who was the band, but it was sell, sold out and there were people with their faces <clears throat> pressed up against my window trying to get tickets. And somebody, I don't know who it was, Bill or Brian or someone came in and gave me a gun, a, a rifle. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want that? <laughs> so I sat, I sat. <laughs> because I still had tickets to give to like, not Will Call, yeah, I don't know what it was I called. I don't know what it was called at that time, but it was when people already paid for They're the tickets, the so they, they were on the list on to give them. Yeah. And so I would have to give them stuff, but we, I had no sick tickets to sell. So I sat there going, don't Did touch me. Really? I do remember, yeah. That only happened once. And that was only one, the only one time that I was a little afraid because it was, um, 
people really wanted to get in and it was sold out. They always had people trying to sneak in, whether they were coming through the fans, taking a sledgehammer for like grandfather, beating down the wall. They were going to try anything, coming in from the ceiling, any kind of way, because I mean, they were doing that for Bob Marley, for sure. They were coming in from the seal, and they were trying to get in this place, you know what I mean? Because it was a sellout. Bob Marley was just like, it was, the neat thing about the Marley show is he, he booked and canceled. Now, it's an 1,800-seat room. We regularly sold 2,200 because nobody's watching. Well, only half the tickets refunded. He goes out again, and they make the decision to sell the whole hall out again. Bob Marley and the Whalers come in, okay? And we got a good crowd that night, and they had some, some good uh, lip service around town, man. There was a little buzz about them coming in and all. And um, I would say probably there were at least three, four, five hundred people on Chapatula Street bent around. People were climbing up the back of the building, going across the roof, through the, or I don't know if they were coming through the side, but they were going through the big ceiling fans, dropping to the big you know, six, one foot by one foot cypress timbers, and they were dropping like ants. It's about 10 minutes before showtime. Fox, Jim, where's the, where, where's the band? Where are them guys? Keep an eye on me. I said, well, Fox, did we hear a second ago, man? Find them, let's go. So I walk out the side door, I look down the street. I look down the street this way. I asked one of the guys working the door. I said, man, just hear me. He said, well, how do you know a second ago? I turn around, and just as I'm going back in the door, the back end of the trailer opens up. And I want to tell you this right now, okay? And I worked a lot of festivals. Without a doubt, by far and above, the biggest gungy cloud I have ever seen in my life came out when they opened that trailer. And the, and the, the really funniest thing about it was all the people were in line this way, facing this way. And as they got out and that cloud of smoke came over, it was just like it was reaching out and grabbing people by the nostrils. And you just saw this crowd like a domino effect. People turning back like that. I had never seen somebody come out on stage and have a, a big spliff this long <laughs> light it up. <laughs> and the police didn't do it nothing. <laughs> By the time the show starts, the place is packed. You feel like you're in a sweat box. We had 5,000 people in there. It was probably New Orleans' first perfectly integrated audience, but absolutely no problems. To see him in person, man, and he had all that hair, the dreadlocks, it looked like the head of Medusa. And he just yelled out, Professor Long, and I'll sweat up. <laughs> He said, Professor Long here, and he told the audience that when he was coming up, he said uh, he would tune into New Orleans radio. Everybody pulls their umbrellas out, their second lining by Marley. That was really memorable. Fire Marshal was really coming down on the place, and the city was trying to close the place down, using any opportunity they could get. So the fire marshal would say that there's no smoking allowed in the place because it was a fire hazard. So I had to open what was originally called the smoke patrol. We had the staff, we had a number of folks that would wear it. We would give, gave them the warehouse shirts, jerseys. They would wear it so people could identify them and they'd run around with their little flashlights and when they'd see somebody light up, they would ask them to put it out. And John did it and he, would, he was, he was a short guy, but I mean, he was ferocious. I was on smoke patrol one night. That's it. Well, all I know is that they were there, and I always thought it was hilarious because I vaguely remember to be on the smoke patrol, you got a t shirt and a flashlight and, you know, a ticket to the concert. So they, their job was to go around and make sure nobody was smoking. <laughs> that was it, it wasn't complicated. <laughs> I also don't know how effective it was. I had no idea what I was supposed to do. I just knew I was getting in for free. And I went into this little office they had there. And, uh, it was Billy and uh, Don. And they met everybody and they said, OK, uh, what are you going to do when you catch somebody smoking? And I was probably stoned at the time. And, uh, 
And Billy answered for me. He says, you take it from him, and you keep it, and you go smoke it later. And I you know, said, huh? <laughs> okay. It's really funny because we were always the counterculture, even in a town as, you know, open as New Orleans. We were still looked down upon by the police. They were constantly trying to infiltrate my smoke patrol. And there was this one guy that used to hang around all the time. His name was Ronnie Venezia. And he kept trying to get on the smoke patrol. I wouldn't hire the guy. I thought he was a cop. He was a cop. <laughs> he was trying to get in and everything. And I think the only guy he really busted was the only guy who didn't even smoke pot, and that was Robin Tate. I, I don't know how that happened. John Diaz was in charge of uh, smoke patrol, who was the craziest wound up five foot guy you'll ever see in your life and he was I mean if there was a match he was on it he saw he he, he would see it and he'd be in their face and he'd have someone there with him John had his feelers out I guess they had people watching the smoker and the smoke patrol people and naturally that was my last gig <laughs> The people out there thought I was busting people on joints. They gave me a nickname, Little General, vilified me in all the underground press and stuff as the narc of uh, the warehouse. But what I was trying to do, we're trying to keep the place open because they would close us down. And it wasn't so much if you were quietly smoking a joint and you couldn't see it, I was fine with that. But if you're openly smoking a cigarette, that's what it had to go. So. It was more about that, but um, it was a lot of fun in those early days. It was crazy in there. Guys climbing up poles, you know. I would always remember guys sitting on the rafters in, in, in the warehouse. And sometimes you sit there, and it was funny, because, you know, like, it's between the, 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 the bands playing. There's the break and the music's playing. And you're just sitting there, and I guess you're in a certain state of mind, you know. And, and you're just staring at this guy climbing this raft of, all the way from the back, all the way to the front. He's right over the stage. And as soon as he gets there, there's Beaver, Beaver Police, you know, the security. All right, come down. This guy had worked for like 20 minutes climbing all the way to the front for nothing, you know what I mean? But that's what they did. I mean, it was just, it was just crazy that's going on the whole time. You know, the establishment hated it. The cops hated it. We'd go to the warehouse for shows. We'd be pulled over by the police right away. Pulled out, harassed, checked. I mean, it'd be the same cops doing it every day. You know, they knew who we were, but then finally, you know, when there were cars being broken into, the only way to handle was to, to get the police because they weren't going to respond to any calls. Anything happened, call the police, they weren't coming, you know, with the shows. So finally, you had to put them on the payroll. And once we did that, we were part of it. I saw great groups there. My favorite all-time group, I think, was Joe Cocker with Mad Dogs and Englishmen. Osabisa, Mandrill. The Who's final concerts were, were great. You know, I saw J.J. Kale and the Marshall Tucker Band. Freddie King, oh my God, Freddie King. B.B. King, Albert King. Leon Russell played the hottest Saturday night ever. I know we had Blue Ice to coat one night, we had Boston the next night. David Bowie played the warehouse, the one and only time. I heard Jeff Rotol, you know, the original band. Uh, we had Proco Harum. And I tell you, those guys tore it up. I mean, really good. Santana. Bar none. Absolutely Santana. The Clash. Dude, I was a big fan of The Clash. A buddy Mile Express and Blue Cheer. To the Eagles, of course, played there. Quicksilver Messenger Service. That was pretty hot. Jeff Beck, you know, I like the guitar heroes. ZZ Top Before the Beards. I saw Wishbone Ash. I saw Blood Rock. I saw Grand Funk Railroad. And then, of course, I saw a gazillion times the Allman Brothers. In 1970, 71, the Allman Brothers would play the warehouse every three months and they would bring the place down. Sometimes they'd play two and three nights in a row, and after they finished the concert, they'd go back to the hotel and start jamming. And the next day, they'd come out in Audubon Park or City Park and play for free. It was just an incredible time, and uh, you, know, you don't see that happening anymore. You know, it's, just, it's all business now. The Elmer Brothers were a band that 
they were basically our house band. At least that's how I think we felt about them. You know, we couldn't we couldn't get too much of the Armour Brothers. It was probably the most distinctive music hall showcase that we ever played, and the band loved it. The band loved the city. The band loved the pretty girls. <laughs> Dicky Betts in Ramblin' Man, you know, the line, the Delta women think the world of me. And that was pretty much covered everybody, band and crew. Always a treat to go to New Orleans. We were on top of the world, you know, and the warehouse was just like icing on the cake, you know. I mean, you got, in the early days, I mean, you got hot women, booze, drugs, man, we were just rocking. Got the jam with the Almond Brothers. <laughs> well, I knew one of the guys in the Almond Brothers, the drummer, Jay Johnny, because he's from uh, the Gulf Coast. Past Chris Chanting, his hometown, and I played gigs with him, you know, a long time before he joined the Allman Brothers, you know. And I was just shocked, you know, to see him touring with the greatest rock and roll band in the world. And um, they would play forever. You know, they would just go on, they would start at whatever time, and they'd wind up playing three, four, five hours, you know, sometimes. They would come and play, the, you know, for the first hour and a half or so, and then the, the feature band would come on, and then Allman Brothers would come on immediately afterwards, and then they played till like four o'clock in the morning. And then they went home to the hotel and played in the hotel bars, and then the park the next day. It, it was an uncanny. I mean, you'd wonder where they got their energy from. I don't know. They knew something was going on at the same time. They could feel that energy from the crowd, and they were young, and they were just starting out, and it was like, it's the perfect venue to, 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 to hear music. Elmer Brothers were like family, at least to me, and I'm sure they were to Fox and Jansen too. It was like, they were just good old boys. Yeah, they still are. The Elmer Brothers played three New Year's Eves in a row, and it was absolutely spectacular. In 1972, they got busted uh, here in New Orleans um, by the NOPD, uh, who broke down the doors in their room. The elevator door opens, and me and Twig step out, and we hear this loud laughing and joking. And at the end of the hall, here come a whole bunch of guys. Some of them in shorts, some of them in slacks, right? Just, it looks like guys going to a convention or something, right? Don Fox and I were in a room with all the money to pay the group, and we're hearing at the, the disco that they had downstairs, they're playing uh, Midnight Rider. I mean, Twig stood there watching them, and we kind of just froze a minute, because all of a sudden, the Two guys drop off at this door, two guys at this door, two guys, and they're all our rooms, and they're dropping off by twos. And all of a sudden, 18 hotel rooms, were doors were smashed in simultaneously. There was a huge bust. To this day, I think it was a setup. Right then, me and Twigs knew something was up because they started busting in doors. And I, just, I had a chunk of hash in my pocket, and there's a butt can right outside the elevator, right beside me. And one of them round ones with a round, little round hole in the middle, and I just took that ash and dropped it right. And then me and Twigs backed into the elevator and went back down. Of course, they got us when we got downstairs, and back up we went. And um, Dickie Betts, who can fight as well as he can play guitar, did not recognize them as being cops, because they were playing clothes. And so he attacked them, and he is like a master at kung fu, and karate, and so he attacked the NOPD um, and did pretty well at it until they cracked him in the face with a billy club. They tried to seize my money, my briefcase, and uh, I wasn't letting up on that. But uh, finally they cleared me to uh, uh, go down and bail out the boys. And I spent from probably around midnight till after daylight, uh, bailing out the band, friends, every, people who just had gravitated to the hotel room. Dickie Betts was one of the last ones I got out. And the uh, first thing he said to me, well, I want to get some breakfast, then I want to tell the guys to go set up the equipment we're going to play. The next day, Greg Allman and Dickie Betts went out to City Park and played for free in the park after getting out of jail just hours earlier. They came out and played for free in the park. The people of the city of New Orleans just really, young people just took to them. I mean, it was just amazing how great they were. Dwayne Allman, to me, was the best guitarist of all time. 
hands down. Uh, Eric Clapton even went on record as saying, Dwayne Allman is the best guitarist that he's ever heard. Unfortunately, Dwayne Allman died at 24 in a motorcycle accident. The next month, maybe six weeks later, the Allman Brothers Band played their annual New Year's Eve concert at the warehouse. And it was a very tearful uh, situation because New Orleans loved the Allman Brothers and New Orleans loved Dwayne Allman. And I mean, I mean, that guy just kicked ass when he got on stage with a guitar. And now it all fell upon Dickie Betts, who was the secondary guitarist in the band and who took over. Uh, and it was the Allman Brothers' choice not to add another guitarist at that time. Um, and when they got on stage that night, I mean, I remember them talking backstage and they were basically saying, this is New Orleans. And they, I believe, I think it was their very first show since Dwayne died. He, he died you know, like six, eight weeks earlier. And they went on stage and it was a phenomenal night. I thought they were gonna take us around the world to be perfectly honest with you. Unfortunately, they took us to two funerals. And, uh, but it doesn't diminish the fact that they, were, they still are a tremendous band, you know. It's like anything, when someone falls off, I mean, it's hard to lose them, but you know, the other people pick it up. Yeah, you have to go in. And that's what they did, and they're still doing it. One night when the Allman Brothers played and they had an opening band, they always had at least one, maybe two bands that were frequently unknown. This three-piece band sets up, and here comes this guy, almost could have been an accountant. He's got short hair, clean-shaven, and a stark white suit. Picks up the last Paul's Billy Gibbons, ZZ Top. First time ZZ Top showed up, they just showed up. ZZ Top uh, was another example. In their early 20s, they were at the warehouse long before the beards. I was shooting pictures of ZZ Top with no beards, uh, or the very beginning of their beards. Um, now they look like Father Time, but that's, you know, it's another day. My girlfriend at the time, actually her roommate was Billy Gibbons, the lead guitar player for ZZ Top, was at Dominican College, she was her roommate. And uh, she had told him about this place, the warehouse, and so they came down there and they pestered and Fox, and was, I think it was a Quicksilver Almond Brothers chase show. We put them on first, and uh, so it was a four act show, and man, they just, three little guys, they just blew everybody away. Billy Gibbons was wailing, man. He, he, I mean, I was like, I'm just standing there. I don't know who these people are. And it's just like, damn, you know, this guy can play the guitar, you know? And that was just one of those nights. And they played in that place, gee, at least twice a year, you know? Two shows, one in the fall, one in the spring. Um, and ZZ was just a show, but every time they had some other theatrics on it. Yeah, ZZ Top was just out of sight. I mean, they were just, just that, that beat that was there and it was cool. ZZ Top would come in, they recorded Fandango there. Somebody took the picture that's on the back of the album cover and I was second right behind the fence that night. I was in the crowd and it's gotta be me. It's just, you know, they, they might have did some, uh, you know, touch up to the photo, but it's gotta be my silhouette. I don't even know. I'd like to see the original picture of that. Foghead is another band that we used to, on occasion, certainly for Foghat, we would go to the airport, go down to the gate, meet the band as they came off the plane, and second line through the airport. Because Foghat was another band that used to come in all the time to uh, the warehouse, so we became all friends. You know, like I said, they'd come in a couple of days early and we'd go out drinking and stuff. Every Sunday we'd take our boat out at noon and anybody was welcome to show up. In fact, Brian Glenn showed up with Fog Hat one Sunday, and we took Fog Hat out, which was so great. They were such nice people, and we had a great time. And they welcomed the break from their tour, you know. So it was really awesome. It was that first Fog Hat show that I saw uh, with the horns and stuff? Because Dave Previtt, they used to call him Lonesome Dave for a reason, because he was real shy when he was walking around. You wouldn't think this guy was a rock star at all, but you gave him a guitar. He put him on a stage, he just bounced and gelled and singed, and man, he was the showman, you know? One of our most prized evenings was uh, um, fishing with Fog Hat. <laughs> this is probably about 3 o'clock in the morning. It was decided that we would go deep sea fishing. And everybody's like, yeah, let's go, woo! You know, we've been drinking for seven, eight hours at this point, and uh, 
I think I was volunteered to roll joints. Anyway, I had a big bag, you know, like a briefcase with pot in it, and you know, I was busy rolling. One night, Foghat, they let the people get on the stage for Foghat, and we were nervous because we didn't know whether they were going to be beating up, taking the amps or doing something, but the freaks were really cool, you know. They got up in, they did the air guitars with them and stuff. Those are pretty crazy things. You know, during that five years I was with the group, there was three or four or five times we were going to close. Chicago was the first group to give us some money from when they played a performance at the show, and that was in the first year. Well, one of the times, Foghat played, and in our publication, In Your Ear, um, we actually printed in your ear to have it ready for the closing of the warehouse. Even wrote in it was closed and listed all the acts that had ever played there. Because that was just special for us. They, they wanted us to be a part of it. And yeah. We were able to dress up. We went on stage mm -hmm. at the end of Foghat's performance mm -hmm. and presented flowers to each member of the band. Oh, okay. uh, a bouquet, yeah. not just a single rose, right. but a bouquet of and roses. And that was the night the warehouse was supposed to close. Supposed to close, to close right. Mm -hmm. People were going to know that this was the last show, and when Fog had found out about it, they, um, they, gave, they gave us the money. We didn't have to pay them, and they kept us alive. We were able to open up in a couple of weeks after that. Great little group. Great bunch of guys. The craziest thing. There would be a couple of them. I don't know, man. I think Iggy Pop pouring hot wax down his front pants, in his pants, that was pretty crazy. <laughs> I have to say that was crazy. I don't even think he felt it, man. Joe Cocker, Mad, Do Mad Dogs and Englishmen, when he came with Leon Russell and they had 32 people, dogs, chickens, pigs, and animals on the stage at one time. He'd go around the back and watch the show through the fans in the back. There was one fan, and you know, but it would be like watching, you know, a silent film. You know, you're watching Jeff Beck, and it's like, yeah. But then if you're on acid, you kind of get into the fan, you know? No matter where I stood in the crowd, I could have been up in the front by the stage. I could have been in the middle. I could have been in the back. No matter where I stood, the guy next to me passed out. These kids would pass out. And they, they had this one, like, 300-pound guy. They'd, like, roll him out and put him out there on the sidewalk. <laughs> what are you going to do? You couldn't pick him up, you know? This was like maybe the first month it opened. It was like a free concert going on there, and the place was packed. And I remember some father coming in there, furious that his daughter was in the place, and he grabs her in the front row, and he's pulling her out by her hair. I think the first time I actually ever saw fornication in progress was, was uh, in a shadowy corner of that old warehouse <laughs> down Felicity Street. I remember Jethro Tull as being the first concert I saw. It was really nice because at that time, people had brought some carpets in and everybody brought pillows. And it was so early, not enough people were there that everybody could lay down and watch. It was like having a picnic. And we're sitting on the door and we hear it, feel it, bang, kick. And we come out, it was nobody. I was like, what the hell was that about, you know? So. A couple of minutes later, we come back and bang again. I opened it up. It was Freddie Mercury from Queen out there. Well, however he showed up, I couldn't even tell you what, what, who was playing that night. But we had a lot of people just dropping in like that. And one night we did, I think it was a farewell tour for Humble Pie. And that was the same night that Led Zeppelin did physical graffiti in Baton Rouge. And I was by myself on the comp door. And, uh, I was leaning on the door, and I felt, this, I felt a nudge, a bang. It wasn't a kick or anything. It wasn't a loud noise. I just felt a thud. And when I stood up and opened the door, it was Robert Plant. I'm like, whoo, boy. We had like a stage door for the artists and all, and then you had the regular door for the vendors and for the, the, the people coming in and things like that and all. I'm at the artist store one night, and we're talking with this guy. A guy comes up, and he says, hey, how you doing? I'm with the police. I said, look. Go, uh, go down to the corner and go around and, and go that second door, you know, and, and tell Georgie here, okay? Guy goes off. I go in about 50, 20 minutes later, man. I look up. Guy's up on the stage. I said, wait a minute. <laughs>
This was the police, the band. When we hired the police, we thought it was a black reggae band. They only had the song Roxanne, you know, Roxanne. We said, hey, it's a black reggae band. Yeah, but it's a big hit, man. We got to put them on. Uh, so Sting, I'm telling Sting, you know, go around the corner and tell George you hear it all, okay? And so we're standing on stage and we look around and all of a sudden there's nobody around. And then there's the hat. And so I said, hey, you know, let's do this. You know, so I get on Mike Marco's shoulders and here's the hat. <laughs> One of the treasures now. Neil Young came in to do a rehearsal and he did it on the warehouse stage. And the only people over there were the staff. And we got to sit around on the stage and people got to smoke pot. And I, and I, I remember Boone's Farm Apple Wine. God, shit. And Bally High. You guys ever had that? Oh, I don't even think, I don't even know if they still sell this shit. But, and we all sat there and drank Bally High and Boone's Farm. And watched this guy do his guitar and sing for like three hours. And that, you can't, you can't, you can't buy memories like that. The last show at the warehouse was The Talking Heads of September 10, 1982. So I remember closing the warehouse was like an inauspicious event. It was almost like a silent thing, like no big party or raised glass of champagne. or It, it, it wasn't uh, a, a glamorous conclusion at all. They uh, come and go, it's all a part of history, you know, the end of an era, you know, the sort of the, the demise of the warehouse, you know. The, the fans who had been accustomed to seeing shows over the years there, well, they've all gotten older and they don't want to be standing up like a herd of cattle. They want to sit down and have something nice, air conditioned, and they be sweating in the warehouse. It was hot, it was smelly, there was no place to sit, it was... You know, you'd stumble on the floor, if, 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 if not on those damn carpets, then on bodies of people, you know, passed out or doing something else. Um, and, you know, again, that was, you know, this is the age of Woodstock. I mean, it's, it's all this, you know, it's like, yeah, go get muddy, you know, and, and, and groove. Um, and I think that time passed. Nobody likes to sit on a funky carpet anymore. <laughs> Everybody wanted to sit in chairs. The, yeah. the crowd got too sophisticated. Uh -huh. People evolve. Yeah, they don't want to get into that smelly, you know, atmosphere. They want air condition. You know, I think as as we got later into the '70s, and, and certainly heaven knows by the time disco came along, uh, you know, people were dressing nicer. Kind of led to the demise of an era, you know. Uh, but the dirty word, disco, yeah. <laughs> the warehouse finally went the way of all those music halls. Rock and roll got bigger and bigger, and uh, the demand for seating exceeded the capacity. Bill Graham shut down the Fillmore's. All these other, slowly but surely, all these other halls closed, and uh, I guess finally the warehouse did too. The names that Bill was getting regularly were playing bigger and bigger arenas and it was too small. It was very difficult to make the bands work on that small stage. And it was also such a fixed stage. I mean, there was nothing you could move around. Right about 1975 or so, Beaver started doing a lot of shows outside of the warehouse. You know, the warehouse had limited seating. It was fixed in location. Uh, Beaver started doing some exclusives. For instance, ZZ Top. Every ZZ Top show in the world at one time was a Beaver production. So, uh, and the same thing with Fleetwood Mac and what have you. So Beaver started signing contracts and we'd do these tours. And it was so much easier to go in, you book it, you pay for it, and you go home. You didn't have to clean up, you didn't have to pay taxes, you didn't have to fix the broken electrical. And you didn't. That's being in the building business, the venue business. It's a different business. You're a promoter or you're a venue. The Municipal Auditorium became a better house for people to bring their production into, and the uh, uh, Theater Performing Arts. There were other kind of places. Baton Rouge was opening it up more as a market. There were other places to kind of go into uh, that Beaver started promoting where they could do, you know, um, pretty well. And then we, we kept the building for a while, and it was still there when I left. Uh, after I left, uh, Marty Rothman took over all the books and stuff, 
And I think they donated the, um, the building to a Catholic charity for a, a tax thing. The thing that I'm sorry about the most, I guess, is that it doesn't exist anymore because renovations could have been made. It would have been the best bar in New Orleans and you still could have had acts there. I mean, it, it's just a shame because really what's happening now, it's just like a, a entrance to the port of, you know, whatever they have going down on the river. It really didn't have to be torn down as far as for their usage. I mean, it might have been because it was falling down, but you could have renovated that and be, since it was such a landmark in the city. So I go over there in a park across the street in my Nova, and I'm just sitting there watching them tear the building down. Kind of, it's getting me really pissed off the whole time. I'm mad. Why didn't you know? Why didn't the owner save it? Why? What? Why is this happening? You know? I'm just watching the wrecking ball hit it. I'm sitting there waiting and waiting for my piece of wood. All of a sudden, bam! It falls. I jump out of the car. I run. I jump over the orange barricade, and I grab this. Oh, wait, wait, wait. And I grabbed this. And it was a prize I'll never forget. I, I took this with me after Hurricane Katrina. The day that I heard on the radio that it was torn down, I said, oh, man, I wanted to take a picture of that joint. So after work, since I worked uptown in that area, I ran down to the site. Sure enough, it was swept clean. It's like, oh, my God, it's gone. Well, I had a clump of bricks right on the corner. I guess the claw, when he went to the bucket, must have dropped it. It was close to the post of the fire uh, hydrant or whatever. They just left it. Well, I picked that thing up. I put it in my trunk, and I chiseled all the mortar away. And it's downstairs in my fireplace right now. I have it in a corner. The musicians, very famous musicians, would carve their names in the doors of the warehouse. The doors were trashed, thrown out. <laughs> <laughs> completely a travesty. I mean, it's unbelievable. I just wish it was still there, but, you know, I wish, because that's part of me that's missing. For its time, there was nothing else like it. It was a brilliant place. To the day it closed down, it was the special place for music in a city. I think for this rock and roll, era. I think Bill Graham was the one that was singularly the most important. The warehouse was inspired, you know, by Graham. And Graham's success with the Fillmore and Avalon Ballroom and, and Winterland, and, you know, uh, that definitely started it percolating. The two places to play in the whole United States was the Fillmore East in New York and the warehouse in New Orleans. The warehouse was the place, you know, this was, this was our Avalon. This was our Fillmore, you know. This was Fillmore South. Where else could you go, you know, to hear that kind of music and those kind of bands? You know, took the pea patch music of the South and just, you know, made it alive and made it, you know, fill that big cavernous space and just, it just, you know, took us to places that we never dreamed we'd see. You just got to experience it, you know. You got it, and that, I'll, and that's one reason I'm, I'll always be grateful that that place existed, you know, because it was there every week. Okay, most of the shows would be two nights, um, which was pretty cool. So, you know, if you really liked somebody, you could go both nights, which of course I did many, many times. It was the times that made it really special and that it was the right place for, for those times. I don't know that it could have ever been around except in that era. I think it was the right time and the right place. The way it just developed into the place to play for any band that was anybody. There weren't a lot of pretenses. Um, the bands walked around, you know, when they weren't playing, they'd walk around and talk to people in the audience. You could sense what was expected. You could sense the vibes there and all. And the bands were always on their best, for the most part, when they came. They knew it was a music venue and you were gonna get something special. They were gonna get a knockout performance from, okay? So some of the greatest musical renditions we've ever had in our city, period, happened at the warehouse. New Orleans had the right kind of attitude, I think, to make it work down there. It was a, enough of a party town, enough of a look the other way town, uh, enough under the radar. I mean, we weren't on the West Coast or the East Coast, or even in Chicago. You know, we were down here in New Orleans, nobody paid attention to the city, they cared, forgot and it worked. So I think for me and I think for most kids, because that's what we were, we were kids. You know, we really had a, had a place where we just f felt like we were one. 
we were just part of something. People were actually coming together, you know, and learning how to love each other and, and accept people for their faults. You know, it was just family-like, too, in a lot of ways. All, everybody there was family. The fact that, that, that all walks of life, you know, black, white, whatever, rich, poor, the warehouse just sort of symbolized a place where you could just go in and have a great time and get loose and have, have fun and nobody was going to be critical of you no matter what. Freedom. Freedom. I mean, you know, when you were in a warehouse, if you was striped, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. I mean, everybody got along, man. It was so nice, man. It was just... That was great integration. The warehouse was uh, something that New Orleans had needed for a long time, and we had a group of young men with a lot of vision and a lot of integrity, and, and they managed to pool together enough money to, to get this uh, operation off the ground. It really did affect people a lot. You know, um, more people than I could even imagine, and, and that's exciting to, to hear that. Sometimes this only happens to you once or twice or three times in your life, and, and that's why you can, if you have a dream about something, you have to, I think you really truly, you've heard enough people in your lives, I'm sure, and I know I've heard it enough that if you have a dream, you really have to take it all the way to the end. You can't quit on it.